from the book of Acts. We'll begin reading in chapter 13 and into chapter 14, verse 12. We pick up at the very end of Paul's sermon. Last Lord's Day, we considered the sermon that um, is recorded in chapter 13, the first record of a sermon of Apostle Paul. And we looked at that sermon and verse 42 of chapter 13 is at the very end and the reaction of the people who were at that synagogue service. So hear God's word, chapter 13 of Acts, verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, Many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. In the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting And blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And that's a quote from Isaiah 49, verse 6. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that a great multitude, both of Jews and also of Greeks, believed. And the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done. By their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault, an attempt made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia. And unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly, beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped. And walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Amen. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his own word. And we now sing together in response Psalm to again to open God's word in Acts chapter 13 and in 14. Verses 2 and 4 
contain one of the one of the themes that we're looking at this theme of the divided multitude chapter 14 verse 4 we read but the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the disciples and if we read verse 2 going up we see the names of these two groups that Sided with each one. Verse 2 says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So we hear of these who are called brethren, and we hear of these who are called unbelievers. And that's what the great division was. The division was between those who were believing and those who weren't. Well, at this, at this period in, in the first missionary journey, we, we find um, Paul and Barnabas. They have sailed away from Cyprus. They arrived, remember, at the south of Asia Minor. That's modern-day Turkey in the city of Perga. They traveled up north a little bit west to the city of Antioch of Pisidia. It's another Antioch from the one they began. And that's where the sermon was recorded of Apostle Paul and this, this reaction that we began reading. It, it began there in Antioch. And from Antioch, they, they go to um, Iconium, and then from Iconium, they go to Lystra. We have before us in, in this sermon's um, time that we have, basically these three cities, Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And as Paul goes with Barnabas from one city to the next, we find a pattern that's being established. Um, this, this is kind of the pattern. First, Paul preaches. He clearly seems to be the main spokesperson. He preaches we can assume that in the next cities that he goes, his, his outline of his sermons are very similar to what we saw. Re remember, in terms of an outline, his sermon was showing that, that the, all, the, the whole reality of the Jewish history culminated in Christ, in the Lord Jesus. And then he pointed to the reality that the Lord Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, is the long-awaited Messiah. And then the, the culminating reality is that the resurrection of Christ is a key proof of his identity. He doesn't just say, my idea is that this man who's a son of a carpenter from Nazareth, that he's the Messiah. He, he brings the greatest proof he could ever bring. And you can imagine that many of his sermons may have spoken of some of his other miracles. But remember, we saw how the resurrection was the pinnacle of all of the miracles. Because if Jesus had done all those miracles but not resurrected, we could not have a gospel to speak of. But the Lord Jesus died and he arose from the grave. And so that was always the key point, the key proof of the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. That, that was, in essence, his sermon. So he would preach, but then there'd be this second pattern. There would be those who believe, and there would be, of course, those who don't. And, but what would follow is that those who believed wanted more and followed Paul and Barnabas, asked him to stay, begged him to keep preaching. But those who didn't, they would pursue, the preachers especially, but there's a, there's a sense where we have seen throughout Acts where this persecution goes beyond the leaders, even to the people. And so this is the pattern. They preach. There are those who believe. There are those who don't. And those who don't pursue those who do. And what does Paul do? He just moves on and preaches. And then there are those who believe and those who don't. Those who don't pursue those who do. What does Paul do? He goes on and he preaches. And that is the pattern. And after he goes to Derby, which will arrive next Lord's Day, Lord willing, or next, next time we, we come back to Acts, then in this trip, he just goes back to these cities and then back to Antioch. So Derby, which will be the next city he goes to, will be the last city in this, in this trajectory. But in, in the scope of this, this sermon, we hope to see um, what is in common um, 
of all those who believe in our first point. Then secondly, we'll look at the unbelievers and what what is some of their characteristics and what do they have in common in the text. And then thirdly, we'll look at the nature of the division. What, what's, what's really at the very foundation that causes this division as we evaluate as far as we can through God's word the, the hearts of these people. And of course, hoping to apply to each of us because as we, as we have this very example, see, we, we just read from our bulletin and prayed for these believers in India who have been suffering persecution. And it's because they are believers and there are those who aren't. And, and that happens to this very day. And now even in our text, we will see as we look at the unbelievers, there's, there's an array to what degree an unbeliever will do and how he will react But they're still in that category if they are not those who follow the Lord Jesus. So first of all, the the brethren, what characterizes them? What what are some of the actions that we see um, that that even even young believers who are now part of, of those followers, they have this in common with the very preachers already. They don't have to be mature believers, but they already have a lot of this in common. And there are five things that we will consider. And the first is this. The true believer loves the word of God. They hear it and they preach it. And we see this love in both ways. There is love in desiring to hear it. There is love in desiring to teach it. And, and we find this all throughout these three cities that we have followed through in Antioch and then Iconium and in Lystra to some degree. We, we find them doing this. Look at verse 42 of chapter 13. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought. That means they begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They, they listened to the sermon and they were telling Paul, you have to come back next Sabbath. I'm going to bring more people. There's others I need to tell that, that you have been saying these things and we need to hear it again. We, we want more details. Tell us more about this Jesus. And they are begging the preachers to come back. But not only this, look at verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. So they're not going to wait seven days. They're not going to wait for, for, I was going to say Sunday. They're not going to wait for Saturday, which would have been here the day of the synagogue. They want to hear Paul and Barnabas explain more. Um, tonight, tomorrow, the next day, when it says they followed them, you can imagine that maybe throughout that week they met with Paul and Barnabas as many times as they could. And you can imagine what Paul would have sat and start explaining all of the details, all the minutia about the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And, and it wouldn't be a surprise to us because it would have been a lot of what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is what Paul had been being taught from the very apostles who walked and talked to the Lord Jesus. And this is, this is their love for the word. Look at verse 48. When, when Paul says that very bold remark to the Jews who don't want to hear, and he says, fine, we won't go to you anymore. We'll go to the Gentiles. And, and they recite the scripture that says that Christ would be a light to the Gentiles. And look at verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Now, notice what's happening. You have to put yourself in the category of the day. There were the Jews... And the Jews were people who had the Old Testament. They knew all of the Bible stories that you and I know from the Old Testament about Moses and about Daniel and the lion's den. And and they know that the summary of the Old Testament was that there is a Messiah who will come. And now the Gentiles were the people from those areas who were worshiping all the false gods that existed in that pagan world. But the the Gentiles who had been going to the synagogue were the ones who had been hearing something about this Jehovah and their their, their Bible, and they started having an interest. And so they start hearing about your Messiah, and you know your religion, it sounds a lot better than mine, and they were starting to give up on their pagan gods and start honoring Jehovah. And these Gentiles also were waiting then for the Messiah of the Jews. 
And they were certainly hearing that there was certain hope for the Gentiles because of passages like this very one in Isaiah 49, 6, that is in chapter 13, 47. I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that shall, thou shalt be the salvation unto the ends of the earth. So think of it this way. Here are the Jews, and they, they are very confident that Jehovah is their God and the, the, that the Messiah will come. They're waiting. The Gentiles are out here. They have been um, d- very saddened by their religion. They, they see that it leads to nothing. They see the immorality that's in it. They realize the corruption, and they start hearing about Jehovah, and they start hearing that there may be hope for them as Gentiles. But you can imagine, you're like someone who's twice removed from those truths. And maybe in your heart, you're hearing that he will be a light to the Gentiles, but you're saying, I hope I'll be accepted in. I'm waiting for their Messiah, and I'm hoping those things are true for me too. See, it was a lot more of a guarantee for a Jew who was a son of Abraham. And the Gentile kind of held as he could to those strings and promises. And here they are hearing from Paul. Okay, Jews, you will not believe. We will go to the Gentiles. And this is why we will go. And he opens Isaiah and he recites scripture. And he tells these Gentiles, there is hope for you. And so here's Paul who saw Jesus. And he's telling the Gentiles, he will be a light unto you Gentiles. And so how do they respond? They respond in verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, When they heard that there is hope for them as Gentiles, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. They're not saying, thank you, Paul. They're saying, we thank the Lord that he truly has room in his heart for us as well. And so they love the word. They glorify The word of the Lord. And then, of course, we could say that it's not just that they have a love to hear the word. They have a love to teach the word and to preach the word. We see this, of course, in Paul and Barnabas. No matter where they go, they will keep preaching the word. And look at verse 49. Um, of chapter 13, um, yeah, 13. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Paul just goes on and on and on. Preaching, And you can imagine it's not just Paul now. Maybe some of those Gentiles are doing it. Some of the Jews who believed, they're sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 14, verse 3, we read, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace. Remember we saw last time that a summary of the gospel is the word of this salvation. In chapter 13, and now in chapter 14, we have another name, the word of his grace, God's grace to people so that they can be saved. And and they love to hear it. They love to preach it. And this shows that true believers love the word of God. And this becomes only um, increased when there's a danger, both in hearing and in preaching the word. If there is that danger and people still keep wanting to hear it and still keep wanting to preach it, the only answer is it's it's because they love it. It's because it's in their heart. So a question would be, can this be said of you? Do you love the Word of God? That's what believers do. They they love the Word of God. They want to hear it. They want to teach it. And secondly, what we see is a true believer... And this is why they love the Word of God. The true believer believes the Word of God. And and, and as we see all of this, the the, the hearing of the Word had this crowning purpose. These were not people hearing the Word simply to be educated. They were not hearing the Word, certainly not to just be entertained. What can be entertaining about a word that's so dangerous if you stick with it, your life may be in danger. Paul and Barnabas did not have the interest in teaching to entertain. It wasn't just teaching for the sake of education. It was not meant to certainly puff them up with much learning so that they could say they knew more than others. 
Everything was for the purpose of salvation. The hearing of the word was in order to the saving of the soul. And the saving of the soul was achieved through the believing in the word. And this is why in in verse 48, um, we have the word believed. And then also in chapter 14, we have the word believed showing this is the hope. This is the desire. And beloved, this is, this is what we have as a hope and a desire. And, and parents, isn't it what we want? We, we read the Bible to our children. We, we evangelize them in our hope, our prayers, that they too will believe. That they will respond by faith. Look at verse 48 of chapter 13. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That, that was the crux of the matter. That's what was desirable to be seen. That's what Paul and Barnabas rejoiced in seeing, hearts that believed. And then when they arrived in Iconium, verse 1 of chapter 14, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. And so true believers, and of course it's it's always almost like a, Obvious thing. True believers believe the word of God. It sounds unnecessary to say this, but it is necessary in a day where people do identify themselves as a Christian or as a believer, but down deep in their hearts, they don't believe the word. A true believer believes the word of God. And 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 this believing the word of God is actually what gives them the possibility of doing this third, having this third character that we see in the text. That the true believer has courage. The true believer is brave. Um, Why are we saying this? Well, look at verse 46. When when Paul and Barnabas are told, um, are, are are there, you notice how that next Sabbath day where a lot of people came, it wasn't, it didn't flow as smoothly as that first sermon. Um, it became a debate. It turned into um, an attack against Paul. If, if you read in verse 45 first, the Jews and the multitudes, they, they were filled with envy and spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul. So Paul is preaching the sermon and people are contradicting him and even blaspheming because they were certainly speaking evil of Jesus. He was presenting Jesus as the Messiah and they were contradicting and saying evil things about Jesus. So that's blasphemy. It was a very hard scenario. And so then Paul and Barnabas in verse 46, it says they waxed bold. So I'm not not saying anything new. Um, I'm saying that true believers have this boldness, have this courage. And look what Paul and Barnabas did. They said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. And right here, let me show one thing. Paul and Barnabas are at no point disrespecting the Jewish people. They are amazingly honoring them. You you see what they're doing. They're saying, we're here offering to you first the word of life. We could have bypassed you if our flesh would have acted in that way, but we couldn't dare. We needed to obey the scriptures. You know, we find it where the gospel is first to the Jews. Remember that even the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Syrophoenician woman wanted him to divert his attention from the Jews to the Gentiles, Jesus said that the gospel is for the Jews first. There was this priority not because God was sliding the Gentiles. It was just that God had chosen this people to be a missionary to the world. And so they needed the gospel in order for the world to have that light. It was a matter of order. But the the secret was that, of course, any Gentile who wanted Christ could find him, even before it was so openly there for them. 
Remember, we see a lot of examples that way, like this very Syrophoenician woman and, and that centurion who was a Gentile, who, who, whose faith was so great, remember, and he felt that Jesus couldn't enter into his home because he felt, I'm, I don't have that honor, I can't have you in my home, but I know that if you speak the word, my servant at home will be healed. And remember, Jesus said, I've not found such great faith in all of Israel. So the gospel is first for the Israelites, but God was showing his love to this Gentile. So, but see what, what Paul is saying is, okay, you all are rejecting us, but we did come to you first because we are honoring you. We are bringing the word of life to you. So he shows this respect, he shows this honor, but then he's also firm. And he says the truth. And notice the boldness to say these things. Um, he says in verse 46, but seeing you put it from you and, and put what? It's the word of God. If you go a couple phrases up, it was necessary that the word of God should be first spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you. So he's looking at these Jews and saying, you are not rejecting us. You are putting the word of God from you. Even there, you're seeing an honor. He's saying, we are bringing the word of God to you. You all are putting the word of God out of you. You're putting it from you. And, and then he adds, judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. We are bringing you life. And you are the one saying that you don't want life. And in some commentators, they were saying, you know, in some sense, of course, None of us are worthy of life because of our sins. But isn't it sad when someone sees the gospel in their face and it is life being offered to that soul and that soul puts it from him. And Matthew Henry explains very well what the apostles were saying. He puts it this way. It was as much as to say, do your worst we will not fear you. We know whom we serve and whom we have trusted. Thus they left a testimony behind them that they had a fair offer made them of the grace of the gospel, which shall be proved against them in the day of judgment. Because they were the ones putting that word of life from them. And it's so sad when that happens. But you see here, that, and this is a key thing, you, you hear sometimes some evangelists, they don't show much respect to the people that they're evangelizing. And they might make fun, or they might debate in a way that makes the person look kind of silly. Paul is not doing any of this. He's even showing the sense of how he feels pity for those who are rejecting what will give them life. So there's a firmness, but there's a respect. And this is all in boldness. This is all in courage. And fourthly, and so we've, we've seen that the true believers love the word. They believe the word. They have courage. And then fourthly, they are wise. They are wise, and I'm, I'm putting this in here because we, we bring it out of verse 6 in chapter 14 when they are in Iconium and they're made aware that, that the Gentiles who were um, stirred by the Jews, they are ready to, to despitefully use them and even stone them in verse 5. There, there was a stoning being planned for Paul and Barnabas. And look at verse 6 of chapter 14. They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia. And I want to put this in here almost like a parenthesis. It is clearly one of their characteristics. And it's important because throughout church history, there have been some confusion. And some, some pastors, some evangelists in the past even went into cities where there was persecution because they wanted the glory to die as a martyr. And during the ancient church, there were many such people. And that's not a wise thing to do. It's not even a biblical thing to do. It can be even possibly in the hearts a proud thing to do, just wanting a glory to oneself. It became such a problem during some periods of persecution when the Roman Empire was persecuting that there had to be a commandment that there would be no such martyrdom when they were the ones pursuing to be martyred. 
It's, it's kind of mind-boggling to see that, a, that the Roman Empire would have to issue such a law. But it's because they were so confused. Um, no, Jesus said that if they persecute you in a city, flee to the next. And Paul and Barnabas are obeying the Lord Jesus. They heard that there is this imminent danger, and so now they're ready to go. And, and right here, we, we see then the reality of wisdom and courage. You know, a lot of believers today would look at what Paul and Barnabas are doing and not call it wise. They would say, Paul, you stayed too long in, in Antioch. You stayed too long in Iconium, and you definitely stayed too long in Lystra because you were stoned there, and you should have fled earlier. We, we should really look at these examples and see, well, these are, these are examples to us. You know, many believers today are perhaps not as brave as we should be and we don't go to certain places where, yes, maybe there is a danger, but it's not imminent. It is not drastic. It is not definite. But we don't go because we think in our minds we're being too wise or we're being careful when really there are souls there that need the gospel. And where are the brave Christians to go? You see, Paul and Barnabas, they, they were... They were inspired by the Lord. They were guided by God. We can see them as examples that the courage that they manifested and the length of time they stayed is kind of a pattern to us. Let us not be leery. Let us not be afraid to go perhaps where there is general danger but not imminent danger. The moment they heard a plot was there to kill them, that's where wisdom came in and they fled. So see, there's a balance. And we need to be careful not to flee too early or maybe not to even go certain places because we're simply afraid. So they were brave and they were wise. Can this be said of you? You see, do you love the Word? Do you believe in the Word? Do you have a courage that looks to Christ with wisdom that is balanced? And then fifthly and lastly, they showed sacrificial love. We will look more at this next time. Um, and I'm, I'm referring here to the reality that in chapter 14, in verse 3, we do hear that as they are there preaching, um, it says that, they, that the Lord granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Remember, we've seen that already, that when they're doing signs and wonders where they're healing people, that was them showing love, and yes, where God gave miraculous power. And then there's the example of that man in Lystra who was crippled from his mother's womb. Paul saw him. He identified that this man, um, see, perceiving that he had faith to be healed. In verse 10, he said with a loud voice, Obviously, he wanted other people to see what was happening. And he said, stand up on thy feet. And he leaped and he walked. And, and we'll look at this miracle more next time. This is in Lystra, and that's what occasioned the people wanting to then now glorify Paul and Barnabas as if they were gods. And, and, and we will see where this comes in in what we're talking about today. This was Paul showing love to the people. And in the midst of sacrifice, because their life seemed to be in danger at every corner, but they're showing love. And, and we can look at these events, and we can be blessed at, by them in two ways. One is by seeing God showed His power, and that makes me believe that these things are true. Remember, the miracles had this one pivotal reason, to prove that what they were preaching was true. You can't just come to a crippled man and tell him to walk, and that happens. And this is just an example. You know, the verse that we read before shows that these signs and wonders, there were more such events. And this was, of course, rousing people's attention. Then they would hear the message and they would believe. So these miracles was God's way to, to put a stamp of approval and even though we don't have those miracles in our, as gifts individually, we have them here in the Bible, and God can use them to make you believe and have certain. And when you share the gospel with someone, they can also believe through this very miracle and see, wow, these things were happening.
But the second way that we are blessed by these is in how we can show love today. Sacrificially. Let me ask you this. This week has gone by. In what way you have shown sacrificial love to somebody? And especially to someone who's not a believer. And you've served them simply for the desire to serve. Not to get anything back. It's not your job. You're not being paid for it. Maybe there will be negative consequences. Maybe people will speak evil of you, but you're going to show love anyway. You're giving of your time. You could be in a job and get money for it, but you're sacrificing that to show love to a soul. This is what Paul was doing. When he heals this man, he's showing love in the danger of his life. This is so much true that he ends up stoned at the end of this event. So I'm not, I'm not making things up. It was dangerous to be in those places preaching Christ and showing the love of Christ. And I I'm, I'm firmly believe that if, if you and I, and as a church, if we focus in how can we sacrificially love our neighbors, our, our loved ones, our friends in this neighborhood, in our, in our own neighborhoods, God can use that in their lives. Because this is what will happen. As you're doing this and they're seeing your life as someone who loves them sacrificially, you're sharing the gospel and they're hearing about Jesus who gave his life sacrificially. Your friend will slowly start thinking, oh, so you mean the Savior you're telling me about is someone who lives somewhat like you? You see, they'll start seeing the Christ that you're presenting in your life because that's what you're doing. That's a lot of when you, when you read the, the biography of, of William Carey, what people were putting together. You're telling us about Jesus who gave his life for us as a sacrifice. And you're here in a country where you might die at any given moment because you're preaching Christ and it's against the law. It's against Hinduism. They'll hate you for it. But they were seeing that he was willing to be like Christ while he presented Christ. And so this loving sacrificially is a very big thing. And so that was our first point. Let us move now to the unbelievers as as we see in verse 4 that there was this multitude divided into two. In verse 2 it says, but the unbelieving Jews. So let's see what puts together, like what are the characteristics of these men? Um, they, They are, in terms of who they are, they're mainly Jews and they are Jews who are not accepting the message of Paul. They don't like the premise of Paul. They don't like it that the history of their people culminate in Jesus. They don't like the reality that Jesus is the Christ. They don't believe that he has risen from the dead to authenticate that he is the Christ. That's, that's what they're rejecting. And, and they're seeing that the Gentiles are liking it and even some fellow Jews are liking it. But, but it seems like the multitude are more of these Gentiles and they start trying to stir them up And so the Gentiles who are not believing come on their side who are not believing and they are these unbelievers. So the first thing we can say about them is this. They are uninterested in the word of God. I begin with this because if you go to verse 42 where we began reading where the sermon is over but it seems like they're still in the synagogue. There's a group begging Paul to preach and we read this and it might escape your mind. They're not just leaving because it's time to leave. It says, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. You see what's happening. Some people left early. They have nothing to ask Paul. They seem to be stomping their feet. But there are people as if kneeling by Paul, begging him to come back. And some commentators, they're the ones that brought this to my attention. It's not that the sermon ended and people are leaving. The Jews were gone out of the synagogue. They had enough of the word. They're not asking for more. They're not interested in Paul returning. They're not the ones who follow Paul. And they're the ones who are there next Sabbath 
full of envy that so many people are going to the congregation, to the synagogue, to hear Paul speak. But they're uninterested. Can this be said of you? And beloved, I begin here because we're going to go deeper and we're going to see that it just rises. It's not just that people are uninterested. Our, our second point is that they are hostile to the word of God. They don't like it. It's not that they're just not interested. They're in animosity against it. But it, it's, this is where we see the array. Even as you read the Bible, you, you see some people who, who were... They were not believers. Think of Gamaliel when he gives the counsel to the Sanhedrin not to keep flogging or to keep putting in prison or even to execute the apostles. And he says, listen, maybe we should let them go free if this is of God. We better not touch it. If it is not of God, it will die of itself. See, Gamaliel was a very civil unbeliever. And so I'm not here trying to say that every unbeliever is in this category of hostility. But still the impact is to realize that it's still the same category of unbelief. So that if there's anyone here who would have a civil heart of unbelief, you, you need to be shaken by God's word that that's, that's not a safe place to be. You're in the same category in terms of unbelief of these others who will come next. So... Be very troubled if you're not interested in the word. This is how these Jews began. But then, then we, we see that, that there's this hostility to the word of God. Some unbelievers are downright hostile to the word of God. Look at verse 45. We saw these verses already. They, they are speaking against those things which are spoken. They are contradicting. They are blaspheming. So, so they're ready for a fight. Um, in verse 46, Paul is the one who said that they, they put the word from them, that they judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life. Now these, are, these are very harsh things. They're saying, we don't care for the word. We don't want the word. What you are teaching us, Paul, for us, it is not the word. And that's hostility. Can, be said, can that be said of you? That there's this hostility against the word. Now look how this goes impacting them. This hostility against the word becomes, of course, a hostility against um, God's people. And this hostility to God's people is, is shown especially through this envy. Their hearts are full of envy, we read in verse 45. Now, this is what envy is. You know, we think of envy in a general way of jealousy, but think of this definition. A feeling of discontentment or covetousness with regard to another's advantages, successes, or possessions. Now remember what we said about the Jews who were waiting for the Christ and the Gentiles who were now happy that they found the Jewish religion, but they were a little afraid, will there really be light for us Gentiles? Is this really for us or not? And, and, but they're following because they think that's better than anything we've ever known in our, in our Greek and Roman mythology, etc. And, and they're following with the Jews, hoping that that will be the right thing. And they heard Paul. And they've heard that that Messiah that the Jews were waiting has come. And that very Messiah has promised there's clearly light for them. And so they're so interested. They're begging Paul to keep preaching. They want to hang at every word. And here are the Jews looking at them, swelling into the synagogue, and they're envious. And, and what does that mean? They're saying, I wish they were not hearing that. I wish those Jews would not hear about that Messiah. I wish those Gentiles would just go away into the darkness of their Gentile world because we don't believe there's any truth in there. And they're envious of that. They're, they're wishing that they would come and listen to us Pharisees who, who have something else to tell them. We, we're, we're envious that that congregation of Paul is growing and ours is dwindling. And that's... That's what brought forth the hostility against God's people. So what were their plans? If we get rid of Paul and Barnabas, then we're fine. If we can't combat their 
their message so that the people stop listening. Let's combat them so that they're not around to keep preaching. And so they stir up the people against them. In chapter 14, verse 13, verse 50, we hear that they raised persecution against them. The word persecution simply means they, they pursued them. They went after them. Um, in, in chapter 14, 2, they made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. To, 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 to be talking evil about Paul so that they'll start thinking evil about Paul. And then in verse 5, they made an assault. They made an attempt. They, they were planning to make this assault, this attempt. Speaks of them planning to use them, insulting them despitefully. And they were planning to stone them. That's, so we're not just talking about a mild hostility. We're talking about a very vicious hostility. And then the last thing that we can say is that they were very easily convinced people. Unbelievers are very easily convinced. Um, the Jews stirred them up, and they were stirred up. The Jews persuaded the people, and they were persuaded. Even, even as we see um, Paul just finished doing this miracle, they're thinking that he is God, so they believe he is God. And they're all there trying to honor Paul and Barnabas as if they are gods. But now look at chapter 14, verse 19. We won't look at this whole event of how they glorify them as God and, and then they're wanting to stone them. But look at verse 19 just to show how they so easily changed their minds. Um, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. So see, the very Jews who, who had come from the other cities, they came into Lystra and persuaded the people that, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. And the people who were persuaded were the ones who were there honoring Paul as a god. So this is the heart of unbelief. Now, we've seen the brethren, we've seen the unbelievers. And thirdly, let me quickly go to our third and last point and just, just draw a couple conclusions here. The nature of the division. What, what do we see here? What can we draw in terms of conclusion? These unbelievers, are they just addressing the matter and seeing, well, you know, um, I hear about this Jesus and I see all these prophecies. Look at all of these prophecies that he doesn't fulfill. You've shown me 10 scripture. I'll show you 10 scriptures to debate back. How, how academic are they being about this? Now, really, um, what we have to evaluate is that unbelief it's the first remark in closing, is completely irrational. There's simply no reason. Paul is being rational. He's saying this Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, and there's scripture for that, and who escaped into Egypt, and there's scripture for that, and who was welcomed um, by shepherds and welcomed by wise men. And then to be communicated that he did all those miracles and there's scripture for that. And even that he was rejected and there's scripture for that. And that he died on the cross and any Jew could verify that was true. And he come forth out of the grave and of course it would be hard, but it would be possible. You could be a citizen of Iconium and say, okay, Paul, I need, to, I need to know this. And gather your belongings and do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Go find these apostles and see if it is so. And then go to the high priest and ask, where is his tomb? Where are his bones? Well, our story is that it was stolen. Yeah, but I just finished speaking to at least 10 of those apostles who saw him and touched him and ate honey with him and fish. They say that he cooked breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. What are, what are your proofs that 
he does not, has not risen from the grave. You see, in those days, you could actually do that if you wanted to test the truth of what Paul was teaching. And if he comes with this doctrine, would it be right immediately to try to kill him? Shouldn't you try to maybe raise some support and go to Jerusalem to verify that? Why so quickly kill a man who is promising that the Messiah has come and he's not alone? We, we can imagine that by now that it wasn't just Barnabas with him, but he could say, listen, I'll come back and bring more proof. I'll bring letters from the apostles. You see how, how it really meant a lot that in that world, after some while, there was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those, those gospels, documents that they could read and actually be digesting and learning. But they are not interested in any research. They just want to do away with those preachers. There's nothing rational, nothing logical. And that means, of course, that unbelief is also very unloving. Here Paul is doing miracles where lame men are being healed. But let us get rid of this Paul. Unbelief is blind because they're presenting truths that are very evident, but they don't want to see it. And ultimately, we would say unbelief is proud. It's not that they just don't see it. They don't want to see it. It's, it's very similar to what happened to Jesus. He goes to the land of the Gadarenes. There is a terror in town. There were two of them who were demon-possessed by a legion. You can imagine those men were the terror of all the little children and, and husbands and wives in those villages. Jesus left them completely civilized, dressed, and ready to minister. But of course, in that account, a thousand pigs also died. The Gadarenes come to Jesus. They look at the pigs. They look at the man. It's too complicated for them. They beg Jesus to leave their coasts. See, unbelief is blind. They have God incarnate there. If he did that to those men, imagine how much more he could do to the whole village. But they were sorry for their pigs. And that's pride. That's blindness. That's, see, it's, it's not logical. But what was the message that Paul was giving? The message was simply that of the Lord Jesus. That he came to earth that he suffered for sinners, that he died on the cross. And how could anyone, how could a Jew, a Gentile, how could you and I be saved? By believing in him. Remember that little word that I said, the crux of it all, belief. And I believe, beloved, this, this was the problem, especially in the heart of a Jew. Because in the mind of the Jew, belief meant I do nothing. There's no merit of mine there's no applause for me. There's no achievement. There's no place I sign my name. I don't pat my back. And nobody else will applaud me. All the glory goes to God. And humanity has a problem with that. Because you don't get any glory. But we, when we understand the gospel right in our own hearts and we understand salvation, we accept it. Because we understand if it weren't God saving me by His grace, I would never be saved. So Lord, please save me. I believe. I believe you are the Savior. I believe you did everything. I understand and I believe I do nothing. I just believe. I trust. I entrust my life to Thee. And I'm ready to die for Thee. I'm ready to be brave. I'm ready to go and serve sacrificially because my life is mine. My time is Yours. We, we saw this morning. This world is yours. I'm, I'm protected. I'm safe. I'm, I'm serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm serving my creator. What do I have to fear? I do want to give all the glory to you. And that's what belief is. It's all the glory to God for his grace, for his goodness in Christ. Amen. Let us pray. 
Our gracious and glorious God, we thank Thee for the coming of Christ. We thank Thee, Lord, that as Jesus came to this earth, there were these servants going throughout the whole known world. And Lord, certainly there would have been the ministry of Matthew and the ministry of of. Um, Barnabas, of of Bartholomew, and we thank Lord of of James and Peter and what he was doing at this time. And they were all in their different endeavors. And Philip in Caesarea, where we saw last, and the Ethiopian eunuch and the evangelist that he must have been, and Cornelius and how many people he would share the gospel of Christ. And we, we are so thankful, Lord, that Thou did Cause thy word to be published throughout the whole known world. And even that we can be here in America and we are reading it. And we were talking about the same message that Paul was in the ancient times preaching. Lord, we pray that it would have the same effect in, in the precious and believing way. Lord, it's sad to think there are those who don't believe and who aren't interested and who become hostile But we pray, O Lord, that Thou would turn hostile hearts like Paul's himself to Christ. Lord, may there be not a single hostile heart among us, that every boy and girl and young man and woman would be true believers among us in the Lord Jesus Christ and be given by Thy grace the, the, the courage that we need and the love that we need so that we would be examples of Christ in this world We ask, Lord, all these things for the sake of Christ and in His name. Amen. Amen. We'll be singing together Psalter.